Bismillah wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another episode of the Middle West Podcast. I'm your host, Daqib Musa, and I'm joined by my co-host, Asad. Assalamu alaikum. The, the late guy who his car ran out of petrol. Um, and we're in Leeds today, uh, joined by, uh, well, we're in the Ment office in uh, Leeds. The drive here was really nice, very uh, scenic. Um, and uh, Shahab Idris uh, has joined us, so... Shab, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your position with men, how you got involved, um, and why Asad should give up his view of not voting in the elections? Well, first of all, welcome to Leeds. Uh, both of you, really delighted to host both of you. Exactly. And yes, I think we'll, ha- we'll have to have uh, a thorough discussion with Asad by here in terms of um, dispelling some of the, the myths that he's probably got going on in his mind about uh, Involving oneself in the political processes of this country, inshallah. Uh, But yeah, uh, I've been with MEND for just over five years, alhamdulillah. And I joined when it rebranded into MEND because it used to be called I Engage before that. Uh, Lots of media monitoring and so forth taking place. But I think they pushed their grassroots community uh, program and that's when I was sort of recruited. And I was just finishing off my master's at that time in media with international development at UEA. Um, And... Um, I was well aware of the issue of Islamophobia because we've observed it in the media and the political rhetoric and whatnot. Um, and when the job opportunity came up as a regional manager for Yorkshire and Humber, um, it sort of fell literally down my street in terms of political engagement, in terms of the importance of educating people uh, and educating uh, politicians, uh, educating the media at the same time as well, um, and the importance of political participation. So because I was doing my master's in media and my international development had quite a large component of politics. Um, it was sort of the perfect opportunity, alhamdulillah, given to me at that time, you know, for me to use my my passion and my awareness of Islamophobia and to join an organization which is actually doing something about it. And there's a science behind it and there's a method behind it. And that I'll have a good level of autonomy to use my skills and experience and expertise and my connections to mobilize people, to educate people, so to engage what, what, what at a stakeholder level. A, what do you do as a regional manager? Is it are you kind of responsible for different communities? Do you have a team of people working with you? Or so w- when we joined, we hardly had any grassroots presence in Yorkshire, and uh, my primary job was to set up working groups, get get vol- Muslims, a group of volunteers together in each of the major city, e- each of the major towns in Yorkshire and Humber. And then put them through the education process, train them up, empower them, uh, get them participating in areas which they wouldn't have participated before. So over the years, Alhamdulillah, we've we've sort of it's not mechanical. I was going to say churned out, but uh, you know, lots of volunteers have come through the mend process. And and there's there's a specific educational process. So you guys have a series of programs or master classes that you do? Yeah, we've got master classes, but before that we we teach everyone on Islamophobia itself, what it looks like, um, what the key causes behind it are, and more importantly, what we as Muslims and those who are not Muslim can do uh, to challenge it. Uh, then the the next stage is that we have master classes. We educate people on media, the media systems, uh, that there is a regulatory system in place for the media as well. You know, we empower Muslim citizens and those who are not Muslims uh, equally to engage with the media. If they're not happy about something, that you can actually change it and improve it. Do you guys uh, do a lot of content creation and op-eds and things like that that you send off? So if you go on, onto our website, lots of briefing papers, lots of research papers, um, uh, we're quite active on social media as well. So, you know, we, we do lots of research. And, and we've, we've got a policy team in London. That is their job to make sure that we're up to date with all of the information relevant to the Muslim community. And that's what's really unique about MEND. Okay. And what... what um, so, we're coming up to this snap election that was caused. Uh, sorry, that was called, not caused. Yeah, it, was um, it was caused. It was caused it was by caused the, it, 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 it was caused by democracy. Yeah. So we have to, yeah. So in so, one so way, you're we, right. We need to get over the hung parliament now. Um, what, I, what I've seen with men before, and I think um, we've, we've, you guys have another manifesto that you guys have published, um, as you do with every election, um, and you guys get every political party. Um, to not of, every, the the well, mainstream as, as ones, as many as they can, yeah. To I, I, and and we deliberately do not engage with racist parties. Yeah, of course. Well, Outright racist. Well, it'd be it'd be it'd be weird to go to the Islamophobe, uh, Islamophobes and say, 
Can you campaign against homophobia? Um, but you, you get them to pledge. Um, so from what I understand, men doesn't have a men doesn't affiliate directly with any political party. Mm-hmm. Um, but do you? Not really. Um, what what we usually do is uh, well, I mean, just before that. Well, our, I mean our, about you? I mean, you personally. Well, you talk about me yeah, or the yeah, organization? Because yeah. you know the organization about men. doesn't. Yeah, yeah, the organization doesn't. Um, no, because I, I, I sort of waver. You know, when you're politically engaged, yeah. you, you have a keen eye out on politicians and the parties. And I'm not going to give my preference just yet because I think it might influence others. Actually, I'm not going to give my preference. I'll actually give at you all. my... P- at all, yeah, because... And it's not who you m- may think it is. I'll just oh, put it that very, way. Very interesting. Okay. He's definitely a Tory, isn't he? <laughs> I was just thinking, no. no. It's no he, well, it's, well, everyone thinks it's Labour. So he well, it's <laughs> Labour or Conservative. Look, you, let's go with the stats first. Give or take, roughly between 70 and 75% of Muslims always vote Labour. Yeah. You get 10 to 15% who vote Conservative and the remaining 10%. The landlord, percent, basically. Uh, the, the remaining 10%, uh, you know, Lib Dem, Greens, UKIP. Yeah. Uh, and so forth. So that's the that's the. Do Muslims gen- vote for UKIP? Yeah, Muslims yeah, stand for UKIP uh, as uh, candidates. Yeah, they have been. Uh, many and, and, and there's many Muslims standard for UKIP as candidates in this election as well. So as an organisation, we uh, primarily encourage political participation. We just need people to engage more in politics in a more meaningful way, um, and and not go down this uh, this. Uh, this root of block voting just because my parents doing it, just because my neighborhood's doing it, just because my uncle or chacha or auntie's doing it. Uh, you know, we we want people to be informed about uh, the the policies which um, they may care about, especially when it's about them as Muslims, and it's about informing them which party is going to look after them more. And then you make that decision. But you have to also appreciate this this pattern that I just explained. 70 to 75 percent always vote Labour. Yeah. Okay, and I don't think that's going to go down. Uh, it'll stay the same, but we'll see what happens in this election if the number does go up or, you know, it may go down, but highly unlikely. And then, you know, if there's any improvements in terms of what the Conservatives are offering and if more Muslims then begin to vote the Tories. Uh, but I'm probably anticipating that Lib Dems might get a few more votes for uh, from the Muslim community and the the Green Party might get a few more votes from the the, so uh, the Muslim community. What, what's the, what's the historical back? Like, why are so? I, I've I've read about this in in the U.S. for example, where in the 70s and 80s, Muslims used to be more aligned with the with the with kind of um, mid to right wing because uh, oftentimes fiscally, especially in the U.S., the community is a bit more uh, well off as a kind of overall the the American Muslims tend to be more well off. So they they aligned with them kind of fiscally on financial matters, but also. A lot of the social values that that conservatives have in terms of um, kind of their family values and they believe in the nuclear family and things like that, they they aligned with them. But now they have had a complete shift um, since kind of the 90s onwards where everyone's very left wing. And what do you think the history of Muslims in Britain is? Have we always been kind of labor centric? Because there's a few towns that are uh, especially up north where they're safe labor seats um, and they're the areas with the most Muslims. Birmingham, for example, has been a very safe labor area for so long. Uh, where where does this go back historically? Have we have Muslims as a community always? Been labor? Really interesting question and observation. So if you, I mean, what the interesting thing is that if you look at the Muslims naturally in terms of their socio economic political uh, thinking on behalf of the Muslim community is very closely aligned to conservatives. Uh, in terms of less government, more focus on family, more focus on community, and uh, the the harder you work, you should you know reap the rewards of that. Uh, but that's that's that hasn't happened you know over the last fifty sixty years in this country. Uh, the number of Muslims joining the Conservatives has been uh, quite poor compared to the movement to join the Labour Party. So from my observation. Uh, and discussions, what we have seen over the last 50, 60 years, that, you know, Labour has a policy of multiculturalism, uh, they accept diversity, they fight for equality, even though the Conservatives might think we do the same, but I think Labour in this country actually 
uh, put their money where their mouth is. They actually showed it. Like, you know, we do care about you as Pakistani citizens, as Kashmiri citizens, as, as Indian citizens, or whatever you're from, Africans. Our belief in equality. Um, I, guess, I guess the biggest criticism of that is in the, the labor era was when the Iraq war started mm-hmm. and support for the Afghanistan war was given from, mm-hmm. from the Brits. Sure. So th- there's a massive gripe with this, but we haven't seen the support for labor waning over the last 15 years. It's really interesting to see why why that is. But from our experiences, just on general observation, uh, you know, I've not seen, you know, in my 30 plus years of life where I've seen the conservatives really reach out to me as an electorate. Like, do you know what? I really care about issues that you're concerned about. Where I have observed Labour going out of their way to show their support. And I think lots of people appreciate that. And um, and I think something like, uh, like the Iraq war, the Afghan war, where we, uh, as a Labour government at that time, um, the UK, not we, not I, but we as a, as a nation and, and as Muslims generally, the 70-75%, um, they were against it, but I think just over time, when you look at the bigger picture, uh, they tend to fulfil the criteria of appreciating their human rights. And, and and I think we've just not got that feeling from the Conservatives generally. Um, I mean, and, and that's literally upon observation. So one of the um, I, oh, sorry. I say, I'm just trying to I'm trying to come to terms with uh, what you're trying to say, but I want I want to make a point that um, the affinity that most Muslims and most communities in the UK have with the Labour Party comes from a deep tradition of being supported by the Labour Party when they came to the country. So when 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 the first wave of immigration happened, um, a lot of these communities, little pockets of communities, were supported by. Um, local MPs, for example, that were Labour, um, and they saw the pol- they saw the policies firsthand, uh, socialist policies, etc. Firsthand, um, and since it benefited the person who had nothing who come to the country, who was a an an economic migrant who came to the country to get something, um, they felt as though they a lot of the times communities do feel indebted to the Labour Party. But that, that's feel, what I was saying that know. the Labour Party, you know, with their um, uh, their approach to equality, anti-racist movements. Uh, you know, from the 50s and 60s, and even prior to that, and up up until this day, uh, you know, the Muslims appreciate that. Or any people from uh, any person who's, you know, from the black and ethnic minority, uh, they appreciate that, and and they still do. And I mean, I was saying the same thing. I guess one of the one of the things that that brings up, though, is that yes, it's true, most Muslims in this country are from an immigrant background or they're bra- bla- uh, black and minority ethnic. Um, what what have you have you seen a different trend in in terms of uh, convert Muslims where um, they they kind of especially Muslims who are white um, or Muslims from for example uh, Europe or Bosnia or something like that? Do you think they view this slightly differently? Interesting. I think we need to do a bit more research to find out. Mm. Uh, but the converts that I am aware of in Yorkshire, um, you know, we do say that. The, the figures are, I mean, the very safe labor seats here. So you could imagine that most of the converts would a, would actually support labor. But we need we need to get some more figures. I mean, I can't really answer that one because I've not got any data. I guess on that's it. that's something that what we what we ultimately want is um uh, is is Muslims to be part of the wider community. And of course, Muslims can be from any walk of life. It's not a it's not a brown and minor, minor, black and minority mm-hmm. ethnic uh, religion. So I th- I think one thing that's important to understand is that. Um, Muslims are human too, so um, we a lot of Muslims do want to support. What, you mean you mean we forgot that at some point? No, I, I, a lot of people have to a, to a certain degree. I mentioned now um, when it comes to voting, uh, in particular, um, we will vote for policies that concern. Oh, I thought you were going to say example, we're not going to vote because it's shit. No, we can get to that in a bit if you want to. But uh, <laughs> we vote for policies that concern Islamophobia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm-hmm. But um, a lot of Muslims are very heavy on enterprise, for example. Um, one, one example lots. could be the. Uh, I think a large number of them are, um, but they. I think uh, they feel as though they have been constricted in a certain way. So if you if if a Muslim was to go out and vote for the Conservatives based on this idea of uh, free market trade and um, this this kind of neoliberal idea that this Thatcher idea that came in slowly through David Cameron etc to become much more globalized, um, I think a person who really. Uh, he kind of appreciates uh, enterprise 
an entrepreneurial spirit like David Cameron said in one of his most amazing speeches in the World Economic Forum, um, then would it be would it be fair to say that for them to vote for the Conservatives uh, would be in the best interests of these Muslims? Or would it be fair to say that um, voting for Labour would be much better for the greater interest? Because otherwise, you're just, pulling, you're just putting across this utilitarian kind of response saying, listen, although Labour are not terribly amazing when it comes to business and the businesses of local communities, um, they do tend to focus more more so on the protection of human rights or civil rights, etc., etc. Uh, there's a balancing of propositions we have to do there, uh, especially when it comes to the core tenets of these parties, uh, because one is essentially a socialist party, and one is essentially a uh, liberal party, and especially an economic liberal party. Well, one's quite conservative. I think what you need to understand that, you know, when you look at the left and the right, there's so much overlap. Uh, you know, lots of lefty policies the right would be doing, lots of righty policies the left would be doing. So, you know, the the whole left right centrist the, landscape the left, left is right blurred has become, now. It's become moot. The left right. So, kind so, of what, idea, so what you've just said, I said, I think all parties would approve of these policies uh, of globalization, of you know this this shrinking world, and um, uh, I guess the only difference is that someone like Labour would 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 say, and they do say, more government in people's lives, and the Conservatives say less government in people's lives. Uh, the key difference is that you see those parties on the left uh, really concerned about poverty and people's well-being and welfare, where I think people um, uh, also see that parties on the right don't really care about poverty, and, and that's the main thing. And most Muslims... Uh, in, in this country are like you were stating before uh, that they're sort of business minded actually most Muslims in this country are quite not most, poor not most I mean like a lot a lot of Muslims not most well there might be small or, or, so you have pockets of communities look there's, example, there's entrepreneurship uh, um, certainly happening and that spirit is alive amongst yeah. Muslims uh, but most Muslims in this country are quite poor yeah most, most yeah most of them are quite poor and some of them are not so poor uh, you know well, through through all of the hard work and uh, entrepreneurship no, and you cannot, so so, are, so you have to look at that demographic and then okay why do some people vote labor more all right because labor says we will look after you the state will pay for everything do you get it the state will uh, make uh, transport cheap for you the the state will look after your mail right you don't need to pay all of these hiking hiked prices that we have been paying for everything because the conservatives are selling off lots of you know uh, public sector services I, so I, I and that's, that's another that's reason why you would see if if muslims 80 not 80% but you know lots of them are not wealthy and if the economic model is that thus looking after you and and giving you working tax credits and child tax credit and do you know what if you're struggling the state's going to pay for you but the conservatives actually wouldn't want to do that they want you to work hard standing on two feet which is very islamic but at the same time it's also islamic if people are struggling if you are in debt and uh you know you can't get shelter and you can't get food on your table, then you know someone has to come in and the state needs to come in and help you at the same time as well. So you have to have a understanding of these dynamics. So what about, so one of the things that I've seen is um, in your manifesto successively, so you talk about, I think you guys do a lot of research and you come up with in your policy pledges the things that are most important to Muslims uh, based on your research. Um, the NHS doesn't seem to come up in that, which I, I, I find that a lot of the time the focus of MEND is very much on, and then... I've been told this by a few others that it's very Muslim activity centric or Islamophobia centric and not enough um not enough work on the NHS or wider issues that are that are affecting Muslims as well as part of the British community. Uh I mean w- what sort of policy are you thinking about so the for, NHS? For example, what 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 is what what do you think most Muslims believe about the NHS because we have a very clear choice in this election where the conservatives are Moving towards a slightly more privatization model, mm-hmm. or maybe a lot more privatization model, you never yeah. know. Um, and the and the uh, and the Labour Party under Corbyn want to bring everything back. They want to bring, for example, um, the whole NHS back into 
back into national hands. Um, they want to nationalize the trains. Uh, they want to ban private schools. Reversion um, of what most of what Thatcher did. So mm-hmm, Thatcher yeah. privatized a lot of public sectors. Um, education fees and uh, sorry, university fees and bringing them back down to zero. Um, what is the kind of what do you think Muslims are thinking about that, or do we are we too divided to have an opinion, which is why it doesn't get on the men? No, you do have an opinion. Look, this is what I shared today, and, and this is one of my my counterpart from London shared it. Muslim contributions to the NHS as part of hashtag I am twenty nineteen. And the message it's that Islamophobia we Islamophobia Awareness Month. Th- yeah, because yes. this is Islamophobia Awareness Month right now. So uh, we've put here over thirty one percent, which equates to nine thousand two hundred, of the twenty nine thousand two hundred Muslim staff well employed in specialist positions, such as doctors, contrasted with the general NHS rate of ten percent. So we 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 do try to engage people yeah, about the NHS guys, and educate people. Those guys would still be employed in healthcare if the NHS was private. They'd just make more money. So by by that stat, stat maybe Muslims want privatization because you know. So at, at the moment, I don't feel that the Muslims think there's serious issues with the NHS. I mean. What we're seeing is that the conservatives are trying to change the dynamics of the NHS, but l- the whole population is st- still using the NHS, and it's free at the, uh, you know, actually not at the point of entry of the NHS, but throughout the whole um, process of you going to your doctors, or uh, if, if you have to go into A and E, or you have to go and see a specialist, they don't charge anyone yet. Yeah, okay. But what, what about the immigrants that they charge four hundred pounds a year? Okay, so that's a slightly different uh, issue, but I don't think the 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 numbers are as high as they that they have been, right? So you you're looking at a very minuscule number. Who and I tell you, I, I'm going through something right now. My grandma's visiting, and she had to use the NHS, and you know they sent us a bill, and I'm actually disputing that bill, right? Okay, so I actually know uh, this quite personally. But stuff around the NHS uh, is still not high on the agenda because Muslims are not necessarily impacted by it yet because they're still getting a free service, alhamdulillah. And and, and I think it'll stay that way for a, for a very what long about time despite. Wait times and things like that. It, 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 it's a general problem. Look, before wait times, everyone mourns and groans about it, right? When we, think, have, to, when yeah. we have to visit NHS, we're always dreading how long we're going to have to wait. That That's a problem... That's been there for a long I time, right? Also, so these ideas of wait times, etc., they're more general. So men focus no, on more Islamophobia. But I, one point I want to raise is, um, with, for example, with the NHS, um, this whole idea of private privatization and, and 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 how halal and health insurance can be. Um, for example, if, if if the NHS was privatized and people were made to take out insurance um, de- de- deals with. Um, for, I mean, I, lives, I guess my counter argument, Asad, would be like, look, you take out car insurance and home insurance anyway, don't you? And, and and you pay your taxes and your national insurance. So some people may argue, you know, another 100, 150, 200 pound per person insurance, uh, you know, it, it could be viable and it can be done, right, without impacting, you know, many, many people. But the point is that the NHS is globally popular because of its, uh, actually, it's not free, is it, Sakit? Because the, our taxes pay for the NHS. Right. So it, it is free in one way, but it's actually not free. The, the people of this country are actually paying for the NHS. But the NHS, I mean, you, you've mentioned this. It's not high on the agenda. One is because I think that political knowledge or that political education needs to improve amongst the Muslim population. Uh, population. And there are other issues that are impacting them way more severely on a daily basis. Like- like Islamophobia, okay. like the labor market generally, if you've got people... So, for example, with the labor market, um, uh, is a man talked about how he, they want to be in every... They want to be involved. They want some kind of um, specific involvement in every step of the process when it comes to discrimination. So in the manifesto, it talks about um, having uh, detailed accounts of every step of investigations surrounding Islamophobia in the workplace, for example. So if... If, if if disciplinary had to be had to be taken against a, a certain member of the, of the of the company or against the company itself, then um, in the, the each step would need to be informed by the notion that the Islamophobia had taken place. What do you think about the Equality Act's purpose and how it affects Muslims today, and why why it doesn't do such a good job as what? No, well, the, uh, you know, Alhamdulillah, the policies are in place. The the issues take uh, happen when uh, those People policies are not policy. enacted. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. I mean, I don't think we need any more sort of legislation 
uh, in terms of when most, it comes to the equalities most, most act practicing what you preach. but but what we do need to uh, bring in is this uh, the rec- rec- legal recognition of the problem of islamophobia like we have of anti-semitism but when it comes to the labor market you must have come through research uh, come to research that showed that Muslim named applications yeah, I read them, yeah, are uh, you know, three times less likely to be uh, followed up through the interview stage. Uh, so we've proposed stuff like committing to the use of name blind applications, yeah. for example. And, and in the, you know, that's a, a slightly bigger issue. Uh, when it comes to the media and broadcasting, we want the media regulatory system to be a proper independent regulatory system, uh, not what it is right now. So it's about challenging that. Lots of Islamophobia actually is perpetuated, lots of it, in uh, you know, the right-wing press, the right-wing broadcasters, the right-wing politicians, and so forth. So it's about a good level of accountability and um, uh, regulation with, that with, needs to come into place. With the media, for example, what, what would be your um, main focus in terms of the represent, representation of um, right-wing politics in media? So, for example, the BBC says it's a... It's um, it's a fairly neutral TV channel, right? They say they're neutral politically, right? So BBC is more than a channel. I mean, it's the largest media organization in the I mean, world. I mean, I mean, I mean, BBC One, for example. Yeah, let's just put BBC One out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, not talk about the organization as a whole, but the channel BBC One, and they and the, and the show that they have with the um, what's the what's the guy called now? Oh, the Scottish one. You know what I'm on about, right? He does um. I don't politi- remember any of their names. He name. does that politics show. He's a bit round, he's a bit fat. What's his name? Can can you say that? He's I, a bit I, I round, he's a bit fat. To be fair, we say whatever we want. Yeah, oh. <laughs> no one okay. Say, no Ofcom here. Look, uh, look. <laughs> We're not important the, enough for Ofcom. Look, but the, basically, the guy's, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's the editor, he used to be the chief editor of The Spectator, a really right-wing magazine, and people were saying to the BBC, I think, um, I think men. I think men did do a post about this when it first happened, and yeah, well, the, the, five the, pillars wrote an article on it, mm-hmm. and how you you claim to be a neutral uh, organization um, that is basically funded by ta- taxpayers' money, mm-hmm. um, but um, you, the represent the representation of the taxpayer is not is not evident in the person because it's supposed to be neutral. Sure, most shows most show hosts in the BBC are sure. supposed to be politically neutral, but he's very right wing, and you can see how he questions um, people on issues of Islamophobia, for example, mm-hmm. and uh, issues of um, freedom of speech, and how there's a big kind of uh, uh, unadulterated margin in his in his opinions, mm-hmm. and it's not no one's even tackling it, no one's even mm-hmm. addressing the issue. Mm-hmm. So, do you think that addressing the issue directly in terms of people? And certain people, these people need to go, these people to say, these people should be uh, censored, etc. Or in terms of the the industry as a whole. Because one is easier than the other. Sure, so BBC operates on a slightly different playing field than the rest of the media, okay? okay. Uh, because it's a public service broadcaster and it's the biggest media organisation in the world. And we have to be cl- clear, uh, Asad, that we have to appreciate all of the fantastic content that comes out from BBC and the media generally. Yeah, okay. Amazing content, uh, whether it's educational, whether it's um, uh, entertainment, whether it's uh, about information, whether it's about representation, whether it's about culture. Amazing things come out from the mainstream media. But the issue comes where certain representation, it's not helpful, and it creates... Um, uh, you know, a gap for hatred or misconceptions um, and hostility, right? And so, w- where we've got a gripe is the representation of Muslims hasn't been helpful, especially since nine eleven. Um, so, what you're generally complaining about is is the news, right? So, the news or politics shows, or politics shows. When, when it comes to um, that sort of content, there's massive issue. Uh, either of Muslim representation or adequate Muslim representation. And what we have seen is that over the last 15, almost 20 years, we've seen people who are not Muslim talking about Islam and Muslims generally. All right, They don't know much about Islam and Muslims. Whatever information they're getting or researching, feeding it, it's not been helpful over the last 15, 20 years, which has led to a massive rise of Islamophobia. And and we, we need to sort of appreciate that. Appreciate the good that comes from the media, but then identify where the problems are occurring and what has been happening. So what we want is a regulatory system 
that um, that regulates BBC and all of the mainstream uh, press or broadcasters. Well, Ofcom actually is a very, very good uh, uh, regulator, actually. The issues are with IPSO, which is the uh, re- regulator for press. And it's not as independent as it should be, uh, in a nutshell, you know, without going into too much details about IPSO. And right now, uh, you know, since the, um, uh, the Leveson inquiry, they have put forward a, um, uh, a regulatory system by the name of Impress um, that actually is truly independent. And at the moment, the Conservatives are stalling on a particular uh, piece of the legislation when it comes to costs. Uh, and w- what we're asking for is, uh, you know, the you know a full commitment to the commencement of the second part of the Leveson inquiry, including an inves- investigation into the prevalence of Islamophobia within the media as well, right? So we're asking for this policy in particular that would then bring in and usher in a, a truly independent regulatory system, which has received the uh, you know the the royal assent. The Queen has stamped it, but the Conservatives are delaying on it. So we're pushing for things like that. But you have to appreciate all of the good that is coming from the media. But where it's where it's not good, there's adequate regulation in place where there's accountability, and we can then ensure that any level of Islamophobia misrepresentation would become very difficult, uh, you know, in the press. So um, I think you mentioned about right wing, um, like a lot of the media is right wing. I think you made that point. I said, um, and to what extent is this true? Do you think there's a majority of papers are right wing, and if so, why? Because there's a lot of stuff about, for example, Corbyn is probably the most hated politician in in British history because everybody, every newspaper, everything you read about him, even if he does something. Um, so I was reading a, I was I was seeing a post about um, two months ago in in late September. Uh, Corbyn said that he's going to have. Uh, they they pledged that the, the minimum wage is going to be ten pound an hour. Um, the Express uh, completely destroyed him for that and said that. Corbyn's minimum wage idea could cost you your job, and then well, the two months, the two, yeah, two, two months, Stalin, two months later, yeah, they compared him to or uh, Boris compared him to Stalinism, something like that. But anyway, um, uh, the the same pledge essentially, because uh, the Conservatives pledge that will raise the minimum wage to ten pound fifty, um, and the Express reported that extremely positively. Same story, same policy. Um, this seems to happen quite a lot. So, do you think there's a general? There's too many right-wing papers, and so does the left-wing need to start buying up papers? Well, I mean, I wouldn't say there's too many right-wing papers, but I think there are more right-wing papers than left-wing papers, and which are more mainstreamed. So if you look at the Times, uh, the Telegraph, uh, the Sun, Daily Mail, you know, these are well, the Daily Mail is the most uh, or amongst the top two most viewed online newspapers in the world, right? The Sun is the most read newspaper. Uh, offline uh, in this country and they're both right-wing papers um, and if you compare that to the Daily Mirror which is sort of left but quite close to the centre uh, and then you've got Guardian as a broadsheet and the Independent for example so there are uh, I think a number just a few more papers that are right-wing um, and which are read quite heavily and they know that the power that they yield so of course the stuff that they're going to be coming it, it is going to have an impact on people's attitudes uh, in, in terms of when they when they come to think about politics or any, any sort of issue that they may talk about or they may print on the front page or uh, they may talk about within the articles within the papers so yes there are a few more papers uh, that are right wing and we have observed this attack on the left and on, on Corbyn in particular but I think people are observing that. So the conversation we're having with Muslims and those who are not, they can see through that. Like, we know why they're attacking Corbyn. We know why they're attacking the left. Um, and we're not buying into it. But unfortunately, a lot of people do buy into it at the same time, which then impacts the way they might vote or the, the way they may see a particular issue and the way they may see a particular party. Uh, you know, media is a very powerful thing and it does impact on the way people think. Um, so in that sense, when the right wing are talking about issues they're exaggerating or they're amplifying them or they're, they're very misleading and a lot of the time they're very inaccurate. You know, it, it doesn't help with the psyche of the British population. And, and, and it causes division, that's the thing. These things cause division, don't they? Yeah? And when, when, when division occurs, uh, people, you know, you, you sort of leave a vacuum where people think, do you know what, if something bad happens to the other, is actually justified. And that's when it becomes an issue. You know, printing stories and talking about stuff isn't necessarily a problem, but if those stories and issues 
uh, impact on the, the the attitude and the behavior of people where they can then justify maybe hatred and hostility and even violence against a person who is considered the other. That's when it's a big problem. And I think the media, to a certain extent, plays that role of creating a vacuum and almost justifying hostility and hatred towards another community or another party. That's the problem. Um, so everything we've talked about so far, right, we've we've built up to kind of why Muslims are left wing. But I think we've established that Muslims tend to be pretty left wing. Um, and, and 70 to 75 percent of, of Muslims are. Religious. But the irony is that according to their value system, Islam, yes. they shouldn't be. So, but they are in, in this country in particular. In, in terms of voting. So this yeah. is I guess this is my this this leads on to my next question. And it leads on to what we kind of uh, touched upon before about a lot of Muslims don't want to vote. Um, and their their point is that ultimately, even if you're choosing a left wing party, it's a lesser of two evils, because we feel that either way we go, you've got these people who agree with some of our values, but they hate us because we're brown. Um, I think, I think, the, I think yeah, I think the the Blair government was kind of that turning point, wasn't it? Where you where people who voted for this kind of uh, so called lefty labor um, were essentially tricked into well, a, as a they feel as though they have the they, they they feel as though they had been tricked by their own. By their so own a lot of the left wing policies now, okay, and and you know, um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of stuff on. For example, Corbyn has been um, Corbyn has been non not critical enough of uh, the Assad regime, uh, which a lot of Muslims are kind of very um, are are very passionate about. Um, he's not been uh, and, and and a lot of the things that the left kind of. Uh, bring in so there's a lot of people for example in the u.s it's a big thing with daniel hakikaju and those guys talking about how we need to divorce from our because uh, a lot of muslims don't um believe in the kind of legalizing of, of same-sex marriage and that kind so of like thing. you, you made you raised that point just now before uh which is a very valid point where uh, you said that around 70 plus percent of the muslims in this country are, are source they associate themselves with labor well, even the vote labor I, yeah. I, even though ideologically they should be more in line with the right um, which is what Danny Gigi yeah, but very, as well. yeah, very, very traditional, yeah. very conservative, because lots of Muslims are traditional and conservative. But, the, but look, you know, this left-right uh, element is is just a way of explaining politics in this country. There's always overlap, which I explained before. Yeah. There are a lot of values that Muslims would uh, align to the left, and there are all equally lots of values so that like, would align. But when, but when we're looking at the social, economic, and political model. Right, you would anticipate that most Muslims would be conservative, right? Just because of the way that we've been brought up, uh, but that doesn't not, happen. I would say the social, the social model would be conservative. Well, the social is, you know, about f- the family, the importance of family, the importance of relations. It's, you know, I think we're very conservative in that sense, naturally, right? Compared to the indigenous population here. I mean, I think we're quite indigenous because we were born here yeah. at the same time. But I, I want to come to your question, Thaki, where you said uh, about why uh, Muslims don't come out to vote. You have to understand this is a major problem generally. It's not a Muslim problem. You know, you get around 60% of Mus- uh, not, uh, of the general population not coming out to vote, right? And, and Muslims are fabric of this society and, and it is equally reflected in that. Um, but the number of Muslims actually is, is increasing every year. There are more Muslims coming out to vote compared to the general population uh, in every election, whether that's local, whether that's national. So there's a massive disconnect of the general population to politics. That's a big issue, and not, not necessarily Muslims, and that's what we need to understand. Uh, in the US, uh, it was around in the last election, 60% of people who could vote didn't come out to vote. Okay, so from the forty percent that did vote, Donald Trump came in. Okay, the the figures are similar here. But Donald Trump won on the electoral vote. He lost on the popular vote, didn't he? So well, more that, po- yeah, more was, people no, voted. That, 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 that was a marginal based on. It was still from that forty percent, right? It's yeah, for, yeah, what, it what we're talking 40%. about is the forty percent that came out to vote, and the sixty percent who didn't. So we could argue the biggest problem, or the biggest. Uh, community who are a problem are this, the people who don't come out to vote and exercise their right. And you literally, if you're informed uh, about politics and the candidates and uh, policies and you, you care about society and you care about people and you care about the planet and you care about the environment, 
you would then actually make an informed decision of actually that candidate is really aligned to my values. That party is aligned to my values when it comes to all of these issues that that but, matter but, but to us as if, human what beings. If you, what if you're in a situation, which I think a lot of people are, is that nobody truly aligns with your values. Because, yeah, the left wing is great on, for example, the, the you know, some of the issues that we agree with. In terms of foreign policy, for example, it could be that you think Israel is committing injustice. So the left wing is very good on condemning Israel for that, but then they're not very good at condemning the Assad regime. Mm-hmm. In fact, Trump has probably yeah, been... I like... He said, I wouldn't really say left wing because um, well, maybe it's mainly the Corbyn, super, isn't it? The so super like left relationship with um, Hezbollah and um, Assad is, is, is it, it predates his um, his uh, tenure as the leader of opposition. Look, my argument is, you know, before we start talking about geopolitics, you know, we need to be aware of our own environment, where we are. I mean, well, you, 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 you have to start at home. Uh, you you can't start talking about. Uh, issues that are impacting other nations, where you actually need to sort yourself out here. Okay, first. what about what about social stuff here? So, for example, you know, um, a Muslim could be a labor supporter, but actually, they don't agree with some of the left wing policies on um, on same sex marriage. Sure, and and if if they don't, they need to raise this. Uh, you know, in, if if they are a member of a particular party, they need to raise any issue. It's not just about same sex marriage, but any issue that they care about. Uh, you know they have the opportunity to raise that you know within the the political system, whether that's the, you know through the local governments or through the elected representatives, uh, or even uh, you know across the party. But I think um, uh, you know we, we can understand why some things are slightly controversial and, and and it may be difficult. But if you have a confident Muslim citizenry, right, who can vocalize. The issues that they that they care about. There's nothing stopping you from you know your opinion or your thoughts being counted. The issue is where sixty percent of the population feel despondent with the political processes and with politicians and with everything, right? And we need to sort of uh, you know deal with that of why such a large number of people are totally disconnected from politics, including Muslims. Um, and 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 I think we need to be talking about issues that concern everyone we need to be moving uh towards a space or an environment where i believe muslims should be totally aware of the issues facing a a whole nation or the whole community first actually and foremost uh whether it's the quality of education that the kids are getting whether it it is the local nhs uh, and the help whether it's other health issues you know with the kids whether it's obesity or, or lack of um, you know, lack of services to young people, uh, whether it's knife crime, whether it's drugs, whether it's um, you know, uh, you know, whether it's racism or anti-Semitism or Islamophobia, you know, these issues that impact everyone. Whatever we do, we need to be moving uh, uh, towards a space where Muslims are clued up on and they're aware of the issues that impact everyone. That is an idealistic situation, and it shouldn't be ideal. I think we should we should naturally be like that, and and once you are aware of those, I think then you can vocalize your opinions, your views on any matter or any subject. But the problem is that that's not happening because there's a massive disconnect, generally amongst the population, and uh, that includes Muslims at the same time. Um, so I think before we before we wrap up, one of my one of my questions was that you know it's fair enough that we're talking about elections because elections coming up. But a lot of a lot of people tend to vote in the elections on very shallow things that oftentimes are very kind of basic things like uh, I've, I've seen people make voting decisions based on don't like his face. I'm not going to vote for him. Um, but they make that and that's it. That's the end of there. So even those even from the 40 percent, there are people whose political engagement begins and ends at they go out on the day, vote for whatever, spend five minutes doing that. And then that's it. Mm-hmm. And what do you guys do, and what can people get involved with on a long term? So I know you guys have an election plan, and people can sign up to become part of uh, become part of men's teams um, uh, who are doing grassroots work, trying to engage people, trying to get people out to vote, um, and trying to campaign for these policy pledges. But also, what do you guys do on a regular basis uh, that people can get involved in, even without an election on? There's there's lots of things, but I think you've really highlighted a key point here. One, which we've identified, lots of people don't engage in the political processes. And the ones that do, 
uh, a lot of it is quite shallow, like you've just said. And I think, and I believe what we're trying to do is just for the people, one is to encourage political participation, and second, to make it really informed and meaningful. This is hence, you know, the, we, we published the manifestos uh, where we talk about the issues when it comes to racial religious equality, whether it's youth and education, the labor market, media and broadcasting, whether it's crime policing or the criminal justice system, minority rights and integration, political engagement, security and counter-terror. All of these are some of our policies that we want people to be aware of, to engage with, uh, engage with the candidates, engage with the party, see where they stand and then make an informed decision. It's not going to happen overnight because we've become accustomed to a pattern of this block voting and shallow voting, like you've just said. So I'm going to use this term, actually. I've never thought of it that way, like shallow voting. That happens, unfortunately. So the, lots of education is required. I think men is playing that role of educating the people, uh, making them aware of, look, be more informed before you actually cast a vote and encourage everyone who's votable to vote. Look, I, I've been pushing uh, you know, the, the agenda of... Uh, the voting age to be 16. When I'm speaking to young people, 16 years old are very intelligent people. I mean, I remember, I thought I knew the world at 16 in one way. But as you get older, you begin to realize, actually, uh, you know, th- there's, there's far more uh, to learn. I think Aristotle or Plato might have said, um, you know, one thing that I learned was, uh, in, throughout my life, is that the, the more I learned, the less I know. And, and I think as you get older, you sort of realize that. But 16-year-olds are quite clued on. And it I would, think more sixteen-year-olds will just vote Labour. Well, well, whatever. But I, th- I think if you, if, if, if you, you to the toll gun, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, the, the argument is there that lots of well, you know, young you people smiling? may. I'm, I'm smiling because I, I know I know a few sixteen-year-olds who are hardcore Tories. And I'm well, there you go. Yeah, I mean, and, and there are. Him. Yeah, there are. Who do you surround yourself with? No, a few no, there are. are there, there, there's, there's many young sixteen-year-old Tories. Of course, there are. But 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 the point is, it's 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 getting them at a young age and involving them in the political system and the political processes. And over time, they would become a lot more seasoned, a lot more aware, a lot more educated. All right, Adults need educating on politics. Another issue that I might want to bring up is that politics isn't taught at a young age. Media, in the sense that it should be taught, media literacy, for example, political literacy, isn't taught at a young age. It should be taught from key stage two in a primary school, from year three, four, five, or four, five, six, you should be taught about political and media literacy in secondary school. I I might have to wait until I'm at college to do it. And if I, if I want to become an expert in it, I'll have to do a degree in it. So there are these issues that we're also grappling with, uh, which sort of contributes to the disconnection of people and politics. Yeah, Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah? Cool. It, need, it needs to happen. So these are some of the things that we've got to be talking about. These are some of the things that we've got to be pushing. If you want an informed... Look, democracy works. When you have an educated population, period. And, and what we're lacking is, uh, you know, most of the population who are illiterate about politics and media. And MENDA, I think, is in its way filling that gap. We're trying to educate people in media, we're trying to educate people in politics. And our manifesto, it includes media, but overwhelmingly is, is quite so yeah, political. Maybe it's Muslim engagement and development, maybe it's Muslim education and development. Yeah, as, as, moving on to education, in terms of education, would you want to uh, maybe make it a policy issue in terms of moving moving this kind of, um, these, these lessons on policy into compulsory education? So like, well, we, we have got, uh, I mean, we've got like five policies uh, on youth and education. I mean, I'll read one of them out because I've got this, uh, you know, the brief document in front of me. Um, Commit to supporting academic freedoms and initiatives to decolonize education whilst giving greater emphasis within the national curriculum to shared histories and the contributions of minority communities in building our society. Okay, so, I mean, I guess we could probably introduce something specific with political and media literacy, but that sort of happens through this, uh, you know, through some of the the policy recommendations that we put forward. we We see that... Um, ec- um, educational change in Europe is is is, is kind of swiftly uh, progressing in terms of with climate change. For example, in Italy, it's the first country in in the world to make com- um, climate change a compulsory topic in mm-hmm. high school. Mm-hmm. For, for exactly, and and we're trying to make Islamophobia yeah. a compulsory topic in the in the British curriculum, and it's not at the moment. But do you think it, like something like climate change can be compared to Islamophobia? Or climate change affects everyone. Of course, yeah. It's, you know, Islamophobia is a human rights issue. Uh, environment, uh, it, it's a it's a global issue that actually doesn't look at what color or what religion you are. Mm. Uh, you know, if the quality of our air, if you're the quality get hit of, by an iceberg, no, no matter what color you are. 
Ice, well, yeah, you're ice, not going to get hit. Icebergs are very progressive. They don't yeah, no, well, ice, you're not going to get hit by an iceberg. You, the icebergs are melting and you're going to get hit by water. That's what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Lots of flooding. Uh, land's going to be underwater. I mean, climate, look, anything that if affects the, the quality of our air, the quality of our soil, the quality of our water, we've got to be concerned about it. Climate's another one, as said by where we're disconnected. The most of the population is absolutely disconnected from the issues around the environment. 100%. They are, aren't they? Yes. Because they don't understand. Especially the Muslim community. I think personally. Everyone is. Look, I'm, I'm like trying you to... You just need to go to a Muslim and see how many plastic... No, not a lot of Muslims yeah. can, not a lot of Muslims recycle, for example. Well, um, lots do, I know. Lots do, I do. Uh, it's not just about recycling. It's about upcycling as well. Uh, you know, it's about transforming like I, one into another. I can't remember the last time I walked to a Muslim and saw a recycling bin. In the masjid. I, I, well, I can tell you that's changing slightly now it, okay. it, because people are becoming aware. But look, the general population is disconnected from the issues of the environment. The general population is disconnected from the issues of politics. That includes Muslims because we are part of the general population. So I think sometimes we just need to have a look at the bigger picture of what's happening here. Uh, but of course, as an organization, our target group are Muslims. You have to have a target group and you have to have target issues to, to resolve that. But I think we were talking maybe off air, like what are your grand visions? You know, we want to see Islamophobia socially unacceptable. Men then might look at other areas in terms of improving uh, you know, engagement on issues on, on a wider scale. So in terms of Islamophobia and um, challenging current um, racial policy um, in terms of with anti-Semitism and clusters racism and um, what else is there? Um, being prejudiced against Sikh people, clusters racism because you can. The government said they could track um, specific race to these individuals. So, so the Semites for, for the for the Jews and the Sikh community was predominantly Punjabi. Yeah, so it's about understanding the Muslim legislation community. around around race. Uh, so race is recognized as someone who can trace their heritage back to a particular geographical yeah. place, right? So. Uh, you know the 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 Sikh community can trace their heritage back to the Punjab of Pakistan and India, and the Jewish people can trace their heritage back to Israel, right? Modern day Israel. So they're considered as a race in this country. We're talking about public policy of this yeah. country, not necessarily other nations across the world. But Muslims, of course, they they you know you can't trace them back to a particular geographical place because they come from all over the place. You know they're sort of unified in not where they come from but what they believe in. Um, so. Uh, you know, I th- what was the point that you were making anyway? I so mean, I sort of clarified uh, so, <laughs> the definition so, of race for so, you. So, so in terms of Islamophobia, <laughs> yeah. if you're moving towards the idea of Islamophobia being included in this race definition, so like Azhar Qayyum and Ibn Andi... Oh, you can't area. because uh, what we're looking at is, is incitement to religious hatred. And we want that to be on par with incitement to racial hatred. So that's one of our policies, uh, you know, when it comes to reg- racial and religious equality. Because at the moment, me as a Pakistani, I'm protected more. So if someone calls me the P-word or um, says anything about my color or my culture in a negative way, I can actually take that, move that forward. But at the moment, if someone calls me names because of my Muslim faith or calls someone Christian for their faith, right, the threshold of prosecution or uh, you know of them breaking the law it's uh, it's it's much much higher yeah? yeah so that's the problem so we need to equalize both of these policies where it would then become difficult for people to discriminate or be racist or abusive towards people belonging to religion so there's a there's a disparity between these two but you've got to recognize as a pakistani i'm protected equally with the jew with the sikh with a black person, so, but as a Muslim, I'm not. So my my kind of uh, my question about this um, that, that I've had, we've had a couple of guests on who've talked about the APPG definition a little bit because the APPG definition, which men supports, um, is it basically starts off as saying Islamophobia is rooted in racism, um, and one of the arguments against that is that, well, Muslims can be from any walk of life; they can be anything. So. By saying that Islamophobia is rooted in racism, what we're essentially saying is that um, that Islam is a black and minority ethnic religion. No, not necessarily. I think, again, uh, an education is required around this sort of stuff. Um, you know, most people are familiar with the process of a racism. And if you look at Islamophobia, it enacts itself as a form of racism. What's important is that uh, the definition, which is quite broad, and some people like it, some people don't like it, uh, it has to be accompanied by adequate guidelines. And MEND has uh, 
put forward the guidelines in terms of what they think would constitute Islamophobia, you know, within this very, very broad definition. But simply, um, most people identify with racism, and it's about educating people that Islamophobia is also about, uh, or it also manifests itself as a form of racism. Yeah, because th- this is this is what. Well, I guess we can we can go on a whole episode about. What this do you mean by yeah, that? What do you mean it manifests itself as racism? So. What are the process of racism? You know, if, if you're sort of brown or black, what do they go through? Um, you know, how does prejudice or discrimination happen to these people? Right, the media demonization. Uh, you know, they don't they don't get jobs because of the color. They may not get they may not uh, receive progress within the labor market. There may not be enough uh, positive stories or actual contribution of these people. Uh, highlighted in the education system. Same thing has happened uh, you know, about Muslims. So we've had this improvement of understanding the black communities you know, from slavery to where they are right now. And we're taught about the civil rights movements and, uh, you know, and it's still ongoing. You know, we're not living in a post-racial society. It's still a massive issue of racism in this country. Muslims are going through s- similar stuff. So the issues... Uh, or the way the issues impact Muslims are also racialized in one way because the very same thing that was happening or is still happening to people who are not white, who are black people, uh, the Muslims are going through the, the, the same process. And arguably, in some cases, far worse. You know, Islamophobia is a global phenomenon. Global phenomenon. Massive, massive issue. I, th- I think we need to maybe do another episode on Islamophobia and the APPG definition and we think about it and we'd definitely like to have you on anyway um i think people can find you on the mend website um do you have any personal well i mean social media I, I don't know why you want to find me but i mean what i would encourage is go to the website um you know which is men.org.uk uh, you can have a look through the staff i mean if you want to connect with the staff i mean our details are on there uh, but more importantly we want you to uh, you know look at our publications uh get out on our uh, go on our get out and vote website uh, go and have a look at the Islamophobia Awareness uh, Month website. Um, f- follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram, and keep up to date with all of the things that we're highlighting. And get involved. I mean, I, the thing is, don't connect with me, connect with the men, and we want you to be involved. Uh, if you believe in the value of educating um, and adding value to where you are as a citizen of this country or even a global citizen, get involved and you know we can actually we can train and educate you but more importantly you might come with a set of skills that we could do with equally um and you know there's there's nothing better than you know a unified approach to uh, you know dealing with issues that are impacting muslims and more so that impact uh, you know the wider community all right Zach Laguerre, thanks for that so you can listen to the middle west podcast on uh itunes spotify Apple Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, uh, on YouTube as well. Um, you can send us feedback on middlewestpc at gmail.com or connect with us on Facebook uh, and Twitter, both of them, the Middle West Podcast um, or the Middle West PC. Um, Zakim al will be back again shortly with another episode on the elections uh, where we'll kind of keep talking about politics and try and get different Muslim perspectives on it uh, and uh, and what Muslims are thinking. Zakim al-Khair, alaikum. <laughs>